welcome to Kindred Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. My name is Ty and I'm the worship leader here. If it's your first time to worship with us, we want you to know that we're especially glad you're here. We want you to know that no matter what your faith journey looks like, no matter what your background is, you're welcome here at Kindred. If you're new, we'd love to connect with you. So just click connect in the description below and we'll reach out to you. We'll answer any questions you might have and help you find your place in our community. And if you'd like to see this week's announcements, just click on announcements below and we'll get you up to speed on everything we've got going on. Finally, if you want to give to Kendra Church, click give below. We're able to provide all of our ministries for free because of generous donors like you. So thank you in advance for giving to Kendra Church. Once again, we're so glad you're here. We hope you enjoy the service. Like the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. And fire and wind, would you do it again? Open up the gates and let heaven on in. Would you rest on us, come rest on us. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, come rest on us, come rest on us. Like the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. And fire and wind, would you do it again? Open up the gates and let heaven on in, would you? Rest on us, come rest on us. So come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, come rest on us. Come rest. we love about you is that there's always more it's what we love about you is that there's always more it's what we love about you is that there's always more it's what we love about you is that there's always
Well, hello and welcome to Kindred Church. It's so great to be with you. If we've not met before, my name is Daniel. I'm the pastor here. And if this is your very first time to tune in with us, we're so, so glad uh, that you're checking us out. And we hope that you like what you see and that you'll keep uh, checking us out. Uh, really quickly, before we get to the scripture and, and the sermon today, just want to get something on your radar. Easter is coming up. If you didn't know, Easter this year is April the 9th. And we want to invite everybody to come and worship with us in person that Sunday. We're going to worship at 10 a.m at the AMC Classic Theater, where we always have our in-person worship services on Sundays. It's going to be an awesome celebration. And then right after worship that day, plan to stick around because we are going to have a party right there at the, the theater. There's going to be free popcorn in keeping with the, the movie theater setting. Uh, we're going to have a photo booth for your friends and family to, to take some fun Easter pictures. We've got activities for the kids. The, the Easter bunny may or may not make an appearance uh, as well. So it will be a great time. Again, 10 a.m. Sunday, April the 9th. We, we certainly hope that we will see you there. All right, for today, uh, our scripture reading comes from the gospel according to Matthew in the New Testament. We're looking at verse, or excuse me, we're looking at chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 17. And it says this, at that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River so that John would baptize him. But John tried to stop him and said, I need to be baptized by you, yet you come to me? Jesus answered, allow me to be baptized now. This is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. And so John agreed to baptize Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up out of the water. Heaven was open to him and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting on him. Then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I dearly love, I find happiness in him. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today I have the joy of introducing Pastor Lindsay Collins, who's going to give the sermon for us uh, back in January. Pastor Lindsay joined the staff of Kindred's Mother Church, University United Methodist over in Chapel Hill. And uh, this is the first chance that Lindsay has had to come and preach for us at, at Kindred. So we're excited to have her. Pastor Lindsay is going to continue the sermon series that we're doing on the Apostles' Creed. And she's going to be talking to us specifically about our belief as, as Christians in the Holy Spirit. So I'll turn it over to her now. Good morning. My name is Lindsay Balance Collins, and I am so thrilled to be here with you at Kindred today. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. God, I pray that you would speak through me, and if you must, in spite of me. Amen. Scripture tells us that when the church first experienced the gift of the Holy Spirit, it left people amazed, astonished, and just simply confused. This surprise gift that Jesus promised to his disciples at his ascension and soon thereafter delivered to the church at Pentecost brought with it much uncertainty and confusion. You've heard the story. The leaders of the early church all gathered in one place when suddenly there was a sound like rushing wind, like a tornado. Then tongues of fire appeared resting on every head, and each one of them began speaking the gospel in other languages. On the first Pentecost, in dramatic fashion, something has been given to the church, a gift from God. But when we open it up, what exactly is this gift? What is it for? Well, this morning, we're going to unwrap the gift of the Holy Spirit and see if we can begin to understand just a bit better what exactly it is that the church has been given. The church receives the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost but that is not when the Holy Spirit came into being. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity, alongside God the Father and Jesus Christ, and has been in existence since the beginning of time. Like the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is worthy of glory and worship. The Spirit is not first mentioned in the New Testament, but it is first mentioned in the Old Testament. 
From the very beginning, we see the Holy Spirit present and active in our world. The first two verses of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And we see in creation the Spirit of God is the giver of life. The Old Testament teaches us that the Spirit can be a source of strength, wisdom, and leadership. As early as Deuteronomy 34, we find leaders naming their successors by laying their hands upon their successors and calling upon the Holy Spirit to work within them. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. Later in God's God's spirit was rested on or in or came over the judges, the great warriors, the leaders of ancient Israel. When pastors are ordained, other pastors lay their hands on the pastor and call upon the Holy Spirit to work within them to equip them for their leadership role within the church. We do this because it was what the church leaders did as far back as the Old Testament. From the Old Testament, we also get the story of Samson, who had superhuman strength and was a great warrior delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Over and over again, when Samson was faced with danger or confronted by overwhelming odds, the writer of Judges tells us the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Each time, the Spirit gave Samson amazing strength. And the Spirit's most frequent work is ensuring that God's voice is heard so that God's purpose will be made known to God's people. For example, we see this work of the Spirit in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, where King David declares, The Lord's Spirit speaks through me. His word is on my tongue. It is for the same reason that I call upon the Holy Spirit every time I preach, so that God through the Holy Spirit would speak through me. One of the most famous references to the Spirit in the Old Testament is found in Isaiah Chapter 61, verse 1, part of the text Jesus read during his first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth. In both Isaiah's day and Jesus' ministry, the Spirit's outpouring enables the declaration of God's will. The Lord's Spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor. In Ezekiel 36, 27, God says, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. We see here the work of the spirit is guiding God's people and influencing them to do God's will. What the spirit was primarily used for in the Old Testament was to guide biblical leaders. In the New Testament, God's spirit will play an even bigger role. We get a prophetic glimpse of that role in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, which looks ahead to the early church's expectation and experience of the Holy Spirit. There we hear God saying, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were together when what looked like tongues of fire settled over each believer and they began to speak in other languages. The apostle Peter stood up to explain what was going on and he quoted these very words from the prophet Joel. All of this was taking place because the Holy Spirit had come. And as a result, God's people were now filled with the Holy Spirit. Among the key differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament understandings of the Spirit is that most often in the Old Testament, the Spirit's work is for the remarkable and gifted leaders of Israel. Whereas in the New Testament, Joel's words are fulfilled and it is the unremarkable and the ordinary who receive God's Spirit. In other words, the Spirit is available to everyone, to me, to you. Jesus says the Spirit is the paraclete. 
That's what he calls it in the New Testament. The paraclete is the word that we find there in the Greek. Paraclete is a term that was used to describe those who came along a person who was hurting, to hold them and to comfort them. Hence, the word paraclete is sometimes translated as advocate, comforter, helper. I recently read a different translation for paraclete that I like even better than these, and that is to translate paraclete into strengthener. The word paraclete is the same root from which we get the word fortify. In times of deepest hurt, the Holy Spirit has not as much been my comforter as it has been my strength to keep going. It has been the manna from which God has been able to help me survive in the wilderness. It has made real for me the words of Lamentations 3. God's mercies are new each morning. The Holy Spirit is my strengthener. The Holy Spirit is God's being, God's very presence, working within us, coming alongside us, and empowering, guiding, and shaping those who are open to her power. The Spirit does for us what the Spirit did for those of old. The Spirit empowers us. The Spirit gives us gifts and abilities to help others and to serve God. The Spirit leads and guides us. The Spirit uses us and speaks through us. The Spirit convicts us when we're doing wrong. The Spirit, through persistent nudges, urges us to act selflessly in the care of others. The Spirit makes us long to be more than we are at the present and to become more like the people God intended us to be. Paul describes the Spirit's work and its impact on our lives as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. Believers who have the Spirit at work within them exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the Spirit at work in us. It's not of our own doing. The Holy Spirit forms and shapes us from the inside out. According to Scripture, it is through the Holy Spirit that God continually transforms us more and more into the image of Christ. We do not, by our own strength and power, make ourselves more like Christ. The Holy Spirit brings about this change in us. We certainly have a part to play since we create space in our lives where we might be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit's work in us. We create space through the practice of spiritual habits like scripture reading, confession of sin, living in community, and serving others. But ultimately, it is God at work in us through the Holy Spirit that brings about change in our lives. This week, I heard Bishop Will Willimon say it clearly when he said, The Holy Spirit is capable of making you a better person than your mama and your daddy raised you to be. I'm going to say that one more time because it's something I want to keep with me. The Holy Spirit is capable of making you a better person than your mama and your daddy raised you to be. Scripture uses a vivid image to describe the activity of the Holy Spirit. Wind. And the thing about wind is that wind blows where it wants to blow. And in a like manner, the Holy Spirit moves in a way that we cannot control or dictate. And the thing is, I wonder if the Holy Spirit is like the wind in the sense that do we experience it as a welcome breath of fresh air or as a gale force? that we should batten down the hatches for and against and protect ourselves from? Which way is it that we experience the Holy Spirit? Is it a breath of fresh air or is it a gale force to be frightened of? Because when the Holy Spirit arrived that first Pentecost, it was anything but subtle. (laughs) It brought about some serious change, and yet it was none other than the Lord, the very breath of God. In their midst. Are we inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives and into our church, even if she might bring with her the winds of change? 
Can we look around and see where the Holy Spirit has blown through our lives and our church from time to time? Can we feel her presence among us? Or do we batten down the hatches a little afraid that if the Holy Spirit blows through, something might change? It's a matter of utmost importance and a matter of control. For we all know that wind can be a bit unpredictable, and so can God. Do we truly seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, or are we still trying to control our own destiny? So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? The Spirit is already at work in your life, seeking to speak to, call, form, shape, and empower you. But the Spirit will not force herself upon you. You can resist the Spirit or welcome and invite the Spirit to work in you. In the church, every time we baptize a child, a youth, or an adult, the pastor lays their hands on them and invokes or prays for the Spirit to be at work in them. We do the same when we confirm individuals in the church. We anoint them with oil and we pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon them. But the invitation for the Spirit to work in us is not limited to baptism and confirmation. Every day, you can invite the Holy Spirit to work within you. Ask God for His power and invite God to lead you by God's Spirit. Pray that the Spirit will use you and speak through you. And then try to listen carefully. This listening carefully is important. My experience is that the Spirit usually whispers rather than shouts. Does it ever happen to you that someone is talking to you, but you're not really paying attention? Or you're talking to someone, but he or she is not really paying attention to you? This happened to me all the time when I was a kid. And my mom would be talking to me, but I would be much more interested in the TV. And now, as a mother, I get to experience the same thing with my own children. But I'm also embarrassed to admit that this still happens to me as an adult when someone's trying to get my attention and I'm way more focused on my phone than I am on them. I believe the Holy Spirit regularly experiences this with each of us. The Spirit whispers, but the noise and the distraction in our lives drown out the Spirit's still, small voice. We are distracted. And so I want to invite you to welcome the Spirit's work and to listen as individual believers and as a child to the leanings of the Spirit. In a time of great upheaval within the Greater United Methodist Church and our own North Carolina conference, with the loss of churches through disaffiliation, has there ever been a better time to listen intently for the work of the Holy Spirit? The winds of change are blowing through, and at times it's frightening. But the only way forward is to listen to the places where the Spirit is calling us. I think if we begin to listen with our hearts, she will lead us into the future. A future that the church cannot and will not create without God's help and the leading of God's Spirit. The community of God's people is called to be the temple of God, the very place where God's Spirit dwells. All the possibilities, all the potential for a church with God's Spirit at the helm. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth. Ponder that for a moment. The Holy Spirit, who is fully God, is living inside of us, reminding us of the truth. That is powerful. In the book of Acts, we see how the early church depended on the leading of the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit said go, they went. If the Spirit of God said stay, they stayed. I invite you to be this dependent on the Spirit, to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and to invite the Spirit to be at work within you, comforting, guiding, shaping, strengthening, and empowering you. Oh, that we would be dependent on the Holy Spirit, compelled by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, 
Such reliance can begin with a simple prayer. Holy Spirit, lead me. I'm yours. Amen. Friends, let us pray now together. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Breath of God, fill me wholly and completely. Form and shape us into the people you want us to be. Lead us to do what you want us to do. Empower us and use us. Speak to us and through us. Help us to listen to your voice above all the other voices that clamor for our attention. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lindsay, for that good word today. Uh, friends, a few things here quickly for us before we go. First of all, if you are new to Kindred Church, I would love the chance to connect with you. And the best way to do that is if you'll click the connect link that you see in the video description here or the podcast description, uh, that will allow me to, to reach out to you later this week. I look forward to saying hey and, and getting to know you a bit. Uh, also, if you're local, we would love to see you in in-person worship. You can get the details about how to do that on our website. It's Kindred nc.church. Uh, and finally, be sure to click the announcements link that you see in the description that will keep you up to speed on the different things that we've got going on. It's a, a busy season for us here as we make our way through this, this time of Lent uh, and as we approach Easter Sunday, which is right around the corner, April 9th. Uh, well, that friends, remember that we love you and we hope you have a great week and may the peace of Christ be with you.